Welcome to the Beautifully Balanced podcast. I'm Samantha Dinage. Join me to explore holistic approaches to support your well-being in today's hectic world. Through each episode, my intention is to empower you to live your life with less stress and more joy and relaxation. I understand we are all unique and I invite you to take what resonates with you on your journey to feeling more vibrant from the inside out. My dream is to create a radiant ripple effect from each of us out into the world. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with me. Now let's dive in. A big warm welcome to Christopher Lee Maher on the Beautifully Balanced podcast. Hi, Christopher. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good today. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, I had a kind of uh, a weird sleep. You know, for me, as soon as I put my head on the pillow, I'm usually down in like 0.2 seconds. Close my eyes, I'm off. And I laid there last night back and forth. So I decided to meditate. And then at some point I fell asleep. But it was like almost an hour laying there. So a bit of a different night for you because it's morning now, isn't it? You're over in Los Angeles. Yeah. So it's morning time and um awake and showered and you know, ready to have a deep, meaningful conversation. Wonderful. So to introduce a bit more about Christopher, Christopher is a former US Navy SEAL who endures intense physical, mental and emotional stress as a SEAL and child. By combining a SEAL team mindset with modern stress resolution strategies, Christopher taught himself to free his body, mind and emotions from pain, tension and emotional distortion by developing subtractive tools for eliminating unresolved stress, tension, and emotional distress. With so many people experiencing increased stress, this is going to be such a valuable episode, and I can't wait for us to dive in. Okay, I'm excited too. Thank you for the intro. So Christopher, can you share with us a bit about your experience of stress as a U.S. Navy SEAL? Uh. I mean, when you're going through SEAL training in the SEAL teams, stress, distress is what they're using to shape you, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, they have to take somebody who's new and figure out, can this person make a really good decision when they're cold, when they're wet, when they're exhausted, and when they're miserable? Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to put them through a grinder full of distressing experiences, right? And so they use the cold ocean um, to do that. And when you're freezing uh, and you're full of sand and you're, you've been uh, PTing, which would be physical exercising, all day long, um, you learn to start to deal with anything and everything that comes your way because nothing is more stressful or distressing than that experience. And over time, because a little bit is going in every day, you're unaware that it's, it's, it's building, right? A little bit every day, a little bit every week, a little bit every month, a little bit every year. And then the next year goes into the next year. And the, those two years go into the third year. And those three years go into the fourth year. And and your posture changes a little bit. And your energy shifts a little bit. And your choice of foods changes a little bit. And, you know, everybody uses stress management tools. So either you're using positive stress management tools, like exercise meditation, breath work, yoga, um, or you're using negative stress management tools. And when we were getting out of work, when I was in the SEAL teams, I was using negative stress management tools, which was alcohol, right? Because my body was always in a state of hypervigilance. Because look, we're, when we're practicing fire and movement exercises, we're using live rounds, right? So imagine a job that you can go to where 
you're practicing and during practice, everyone can die. Right. That's it's it's a little bit the you know, the, uh, the stakes are much, much higher. So there's no room for mistakes, right? You have to tune into absolute perfection because we do everything at a very fast speed. So let's say a helicopter's coming in. It's um, we're going to do some fast roping. So the helicopter's coming into the LZ, right? It never lands. It just spins around and we got to be on the ground in four seconds. Right. And by the way, it's two o'clock in the morning. You can't see anything. Yeah. I mean, I can't and, imagine. Yeah. You got to feel like. Yeah. You know, you've got a weapon and you've got, you know, 60, you know, you've got 40 kilos on your back. Right. Can't see anything. And you got to be, you got to follow this rope, which you're squeezing with your hands. And there's somebody below you and someone above you. Right. Like everything you do has to have pinpoint accuracy. Right. So same with your shooting, same with your skydiving, you know. And so when you're at a job where everything you do every day could lead to success or the worst thing, it could lead to uh, debilitating injury or loss of life. You're trapped into a state of hypervigilance. And in the SEAL teams, there's no room for mistakes. So when you're going through SEAL training, if you get three, uh, what are called safety violations, you're out of training, right? You could have been in training for like, you know, um, nine months and you get your third safety violation at the very end of training, you're done. <laughs> we see you. Yeah. So there's a big knock on effect personally, as well as the risk. That's right. See the team and everybody around. That's right. Well, and everyone there. around you. Yeah. So then when other people see that this guy's got two safety violations, right? Guys are thinking that you're unsafe, right? Meaning that you make poor decisions when you're cold, wet, and you're miserable and you're tired. And they need to know, does this guy make a good decision when you're poor, when you're cold, wet, miserable, and exhausted? Because everything we do deals with loss of life in some way, right? or rescuing a life in some way and yet it's all risky it's all very risky and so that kind of emotional pressure right that kind of energetic pressure that kind of psychological pressure all the time you know begins to shape an individual and if you're using negative stress management tools um like alcohol right? You're, you're, you're complicating the dynamic, right? So if you're, some guys chew tobacco, some guys are, are pounding back the brewskis, whatever you're doing, um, that is negative. It's adding more stress that you're unaware of that you really just don't need. And so there was a lot of stress. And when they weren't giving it to me, I was giving it to myself. Yeah, I think from what you've described, the expectations on yourself as a human being just isn't doesn't sound realistic to me to think that there's going to be this precise precision, that there's not oh, yeah. be any mistakes whatsoever. Yeah. You know, as a human being, we all make mistakes. We're not all necessarily alert 100% of the time. And I can see why that would put you into a really stressed, hypervigilant state. And yeah, like you say, you're trying to find ways to manage that because it's building up every day, every week, every year. How long were you in the Navy SEALs for? I was in the military for about eight years. I was in that community for about six. Yeah. So it's a, a good chunk of time to be under that intense pressure. Yeah. And I was all happy to have it. You know, remember, this is all in retrospect, right? Mm -hmm. When I was going through it, none of it felt stressful to me. It felt like we're going to the next day, right? Like when you arrive and you step through the courtyard where we do the PT, 
on the left wall, very high on the wall, it says the only easy day was yesterday. And guess what? They kept their promise. <laughs> right? Because every day is going to be harder. Right? And, you know, it's when you get out of the SEAL teams and out of SEAL training, you get back into civilian life. And at a subconscious level, you're manufacturing distress um, because that's what feels normal, right? So imagine you leave an environment like that, and now you're going to enter back into college where you're going to be a full-time athlete and a full-time student. Well, guess what? You're used to this intense level of, per of pressure, and so now you're at a subconscious and unconscious level. You're attempting to manufacture that on your own by taking risks that are unnecessary, right? Driving fast, you know, maybe I'm on a motorcycle. I'm going 130, right, down the freeway in you know, 130 miles an hour, right? If you look at that in kilometers, okay. It's a lot. Okay. It's a lot. So... So then you're staying, you're staying up late at night and you're, you just, I, I was putting myself in compromising situations because my body was still craving that kind of pressure, that kind of intensity. And so I didn't know how to manage my one. I didn't know I was distressed. And because I was ignorant and unaware, I was unable to manage it successfully. Mm -hmm. Now, knowing what I know today, if I went back through the same situation, I would know exactly what to do, right? Yeah. Did it just feel normal to you at the time? And when you were in the SEAL teams, was it just what you saw around you and in your Yeah. 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 It felt normal. It was, you know, I went to a privately well-endowed boarding school in Hershey, Pennsylvania for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain intensity there because, you know, each of the student homes was on a farm, right? So I had to get up every morning, super early, milk cows, tend to the farm, go to school, come back, tend to the farm, go to sport, um, come back, have a few hours to eat, study and go back to sleep and do that all over again and again and again and again and again. And being a high level athlete at the same time. And so I was already sort of preconditioned in order to enter into that kind of environment, right? And the SEAL teams are 16 guys in a platoon. In my student home, there's 16 guys in a student home. So there's some similarities between so, those. So, yeah, so there was a lot of similarities. So I was unable to notice as the stress was piling in Yeah, that it was changing me, right? It was changing me emotionally. It was changing me energetically. It was changing me psychologically. It was changing me in terms of my structure, my posture, my mood, right? I was getting really, really intense. I had no idea, and which was funny for me because in school, I was a bit of a class clown. And then there were people coming up to me always making this statement, man, you're so intense. And all the only memory I have of myself is being funny. So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm clueless about the, the energy that I'm transmitting to everyone else around me. So after several years at, at boarding school, eight years in the military, and these high levels of expectations and stress, how has that led you to do the work that it is that you do today? Well, here's how it led me. Uh, once I left the SEAL teams, you know, I, I left there with a goal in mind. And my goal in mind was to get to the Olympic trials. I ran 400, 800 meters and 1500 meters. And I wanted to get there in track and field. And, um, and so when I left, I was putting an intense amount of pressure on me to perform at a high level. Mm -hmm. And that is when the wheels started to come off. And I started to notice that something was wrong because I was getting injured on a semi-regular basis. And as an athlete, I was never injured, right? I was never dealing with chronic soft tissue discomfort right? 
endonitis everywhere, joint pain all on the left. And no one had any answers for me. And so I just continued to do and lean into my winning strategy, right? Which is to go hard all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Eventually, some of my sense organs started to fail and my structure started to give me a lot of negative feedback. And there's a, there's a, there's an idea that um, is part of the institutions that I was in, which is if you don't mind, it doesn't matter. And what that means is if you're in pain and you can cope with it, we'll just keep on going. And so I was coping with my pain and I had no idea that it was going to get worse. It was going to go deeper into my body. And then eventually I got into a car accident and then the pain, the discomfort went straight into the middle of my hip and then I could never get away from it. And it was throbbing like an ice pick constantly. And then I had to do something vulnerable for me, which was to reach out for help. And the reason why it was so vulnerable is because when you go to boarding school at a very young age, at like seven years old, you're in a position where you have to become emotionally self-reliant. And when you're excessively emotionally self-reliant, you drop into the lone wolf mode. And in that lone wolf mode, I'm totally dependent on me. Mm. And I can, no matter where you drop me in the world, if you drop me in the middle of Russia in Siberia uh, with, you know, a fork, you know, a knife, a cup, a, a jacket and a hat, I'm going to figure it out. Okay. I feel that confident. When you operate that way emotionally, it doesn't work because there's no thinking in the emotional body. And so then I leaned on stoicism as my main strategy to deal with my emotional discomfort, right? And my physical discomfort and the, um, the overwhelming anxiety that I was experiencing. And until these things diminished, I was even unaware that I was having them because anxiety had become part of my whole existence, right? You and I were talking earlier before we got on a call about having a speech impediment, right? Yes. I know that you've suffered from that. I've suffered from that. And, you know, I'm someone who's overcome bedwetting, nail biting, um, stammering, uh, brain fog. Uh, intense levels of anxiety, you know, all those things I had to start overcoming as a very young person. And so the emotional self-reliance left me on the outside looking in and my body was going, hey, I need you to pay attention. And it kept sending me these really loud alarms and I would take the alarm and I would go in and I would just shut off the speaker. Yet the alarm was still flashing, right? Go in, I go, okay, let me shut off the speaker. Keep, keep on moving forward was the message. And then my body finally said, hey, we're no longer going to participate. So since you're not listening, I'm going to start to take your hearing away from you. Oh, you're still not listening? I'm going to start to take your vision away from you. Oh, I finally have your attention. Thank you. And I reached out for help and I got some help. Buddy of mine came over to my house with a yoga mat and a juicer. And uh, he was fluid and flexible and rolling around and looking great and drinking the juice and, you know, a couple minutes. And I couldn't stand the taste of it. I was like, oh, this is the worst thing in the world. I was stiff, unmovable. When the irony is, is if we were walking down the beach and all I had on was a uh, were some uh, a bathing suit, right? That you would see at a swimming meet. You would think, well, wow, that guy is so healthy. Look at him. He's a model of fitness and health. But underneath, the exact opposite was happening, right? I was toxic. I was stiff. And I was full of pain. And no one knew that who knew me, right? Because when you're emotionally self-reliant, excessively emotionally self-reliant, you keep your pains and your discomforts to yourself. 
right? And you maintain the curated image that everything's going to be okay. I'm okay. And that's all I knew. You know, I was dropped off of boarding school when I was seven years old. And I remember my grandmother pulling off with my Aunt Joellen um, in this orange gremlin, uh, this very funny looking car. And I had this, this ball uh, of anxiety dropped into my stomach. And from that moment on, I was like, okay, I'm on my own. I have to figure this out. Yeah, it's a lot to deal with, isn't it? At seven years of age, being so yeah. young. And yeah. I like how you were talking about how you feel on the inside versus the the, the perception of people that have you from from the outside. Yeah. And yeah. did you find that stressful in itself, trying to keep up that image and perception? No, I think I was so good at it. And I had been doing it for so long. It was like breathing. Right. And so and I think part of it is also being a male. Right. You know, in society, men are taught, hey, yeah, it sucks getting up at five o'clock in the morning. And my mom's family is a family of coal miners. Right. Men going in the coal mines at 430 a.m. in the morning. Right dying of black lung and and you know when you look at that and you look at poor you know irish immigrants and the jobs that were available to them you suck it up and you keep moving on and you know my mother she committed suicide when she was 29 her father my grandfather he died of cirrhosis of the liver at you know 43 44 years old and so you know when you look at these things um, you have to understand that obviously my mother was suffering ment from mental illness. Mm -hmm. Obviously her dad, my grandfather was suffering from mental illness. And if we went back a few more generations, we would find the same thing. And so when you have poor immigrants that enter into a country where there's very little latitude in terms of their opportunities to express themselves in an intelligible manner and get the support that they need in order to thrive in the world, people lean on negative stress management tools. And so from my grandfather, I'm the third generation from there. And fortunate for me, I got a DUI, which is uh, driving under the influence when I was 27 years old and I, they put me in jail. And so I'm sitting across from these five men who are knackered, completely passed out, a couple of them urinated on themselves. And I'm sitting across from them. And in my arrogance, right, I'm looking at them going, man, oof, I can't believe these guys are living this way at this age. And they were clearly all over the age of 55. Mm -hmm. And then I heard a little voice in the back of my head go, hey, guess what? If you keep up your shenanigans, you're going to end up in the same situation. And if that had happened when I was at home, a soft little voice creeps in like that, very gentle, very um, sobering. It'd be easy for me to shrug that off. Right. I could rationalize and justify my behavior. But because of the stark contrast of the experience, right? Metal bars, cold floor, um, guards walking back and forth, no mercy, no understanding. Everything is black and white. You clearly have done something wrong. Okay. And the justice system says, yeah, you've done something wrong. So I had to hold up the mirror and look at myself. And thank God that that officer didn't let me drive home because I was very close to my house. The cops could have easily gone. You've popped 0 .08. 0 0.08 is legal, yet it's also, if we deem it to be illegal, it can be illegal too. That's very wishy-washy. Well, it's 0 .08, so they can either give you a DUI or they could drive, follow you home. Mm. 
And these guys said, I don't know why, but I think this guy needs to go down to the trunk tank. And thank God they did that because that experience was very sobering. And then I came home, had a long conversation with myself in the mirror. And what I came to after looking into my own eyes, peering into my own soul for about two hours is that I needed to figure out how did I get here? What happened? So I called up my Aunt Betty at the time. And I said, look, I'm kind of embarrassed that I've been through this experience, but let me tell you about it. I got some questions for you. And I started digging around and asking some questions. She was like, honey, you come from a family of alcoholics. And then it hit me and I was like, oh, okay, got it. I, I need to look at this. And then I called up everyone I knew that I used to hang out with and manage my stress with negatively. Mm -hmm. I called them up. I said, look, if you're, if you want to go hang out and get knackered and you want to get wild, you should lose my number. I'm taking my life in a different direction. If you're calling me up, calling me up because you want to have dinner, go to a movie, watch a fight, watch a football game, I'm game. But for anything else, I'm not. And guess what? No one ever called me back. <laughs> and my life changed on that day. Yeah, I imagine that did you a favor that nobody tempted you, called you, and you could step onto a new path. And, yeah. and just off of off of the old one yeah i think putting my flag in the sand mm -hmm. and in that moment going if you're calling me for this lose my number i'm taking my life in a different direction was also very sobering for them right because i was like the mayor of san diego like everywhere i went because i was gregarious i was charming i was funny I was up for anything, any time of the day. And I loved hanging out with people. I was very well socialized because of boarding school and because of the military. And, you know, I craved brotherhood because brotherhood is all that I is all that I had ever known in terms of knowing myself. And so that also was part of the identity. And then as I stepped away from alcohol, and I stepped away from late nights and hanging out with strangers and, and getting wild. Um, I started to craft who I really was, right? And at some point, I decided that I was going to live on my own. And then when I lived on my own, you know, the first three days, my mind would not shut off. What's wrong with you? Uh, how come you're not living with other people? Uh, you know, I was very hard. I was very overly critical. I was very harsh on myself. And then I woke up the fourth morning and my mind was silent for the first time in my life. And I was like, oh my God, I'm never living with another human again. <laughs> and then suddenly I was like, okay, this is what that inner peace is. And then, you know, things started to change from the, all those experiences. Each one was a wake up. Each one was a mirror. Each one was an opportunity for me to make a really good decision. So if some of the listeners are thinking that they have some levels of stress in their life and they perhaps turn to alcohol or other things that they would perhaps like to change, what options would you suggest to them to help to manage or resolve their um, stress? Okay. So there's, you know, when we look at this, and this is from my own personal investigation, okay, and I've, I've spent 100,000 hours investigating this. There's three lanes, right? There's stress ignorance, which is where most people are, right? Which is where I was. Okay, I was in stress ignorance. And at the, there as well. <laughs> and I think we stay in stress ignorance until we have a wake up call, right? Maybe you lose your voice, maybe you're drunk and you lose your car, maybe you lose a relationship because you're emotionally violent with your voice and you say things that are hurtful. Um maybe you're irresponsible and you show up to work late consistently um you know you make a bad decision you have no awareness 
of what's happening. And then suddenly the hammer comes down, right? And it hits you on the big toe. And then you have to wake up and go, oh, yeah, the world is reflecting to me that something's wrong. I'm unable to apply my coping strategy successfully. And that's usually how people get out of stress ignorance. They need, and it's funny, the human condition is they need a knock in the back of the head in order to go, hey, I think I need help. Right? That wake-up call. Yeah. They need that wake-up call. And the stronger the personality, right, the bigger the wake-up call that is required. Right. And so a subtle thing for someone who's really strong is useless because they're going to mow over that in two seconds because they have the ability to rebound really quickly because they have a lot of internal resistance. Right. Yeah. And when a person has a lot of internal resistance, like they got a strong immune system or they're super smart or they have a strong will center. Right. Yeah. They need a very big wake up call. And, you know, as a listener, as you're tuning into our conversation, you know, one of the things you have to ask yourself is, do I have a strong personality? And if I do, do I really want to wait for a really big wake up call? Or would it be more important to take prudent action before the wake up call comes? Because the wake up call for some people is cancer, right? For uh, for some women, it's um, it's their body aborts their fetus, right? And, you know, that's their wake-up call. And uh, for some people, it's divorce. For other people, it's a loss of job. Like, like there's so many wake-up calls available. And the thing is, is to begin to shift, how, how do I get out of stress ignorance and into stress awareness so that I can start to get in a different lane, which is stress management, right? And so when you look at stress management, there's two lanes. And the first lane is what? Negative stress management tools, which is what people use when they're in stress ignorance, right? So alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, pharmaceutical drugs, recreational drugs, uh, refined white and brown sugar. Okay. So when they're using these tools, eventually that's going to lead to some physiological or structural discomfort. So let's say you have semi consistent headaches or intense uh, menstrual cramps or a foggy brain or debilitating states of anxiety, or um, you have a lack of motivation, um, you're stuck in a job that you despise, um, you feel like your husband mows over you and gets everything he wants and you get nothing, right? Uh, you're in a state of sacrificing yourself in order to maintain your relationships. You know, there's so many symptoms that are going around. And eventually, hopefully, you've got somebody in your life that you trust that cares about you enough to go, hey, there's this, there's this sound bath or there's this breath work class or there's this yoga class or there's this nutrition class. And you can figure out how to get into or on a holistic journey and start applying positive stress management tools. Because the beautiful thing about positive stress management tools is this. There's no negative feedback, right? In negative stress management tools, there's a cost, right? So if I pile and I have half a pie, okay, or I eat a whole bowl of ice cream, well, guess what? The next day, I'm a little fatter, okay? Um, uh, if I use alcohol or recreational drugs the next day, I have a headache or I'm dealing with depression, right? Um, if I use anger or explosive 
emotional shock um, strategies with those who are under my sphere of influence the next day. There's a lot of anger and hate and rage and disconnection in my relationships. And so with positive stress management uh, strategies, there are none of those. Okay. Positive stress management tools only deal with your daily accumulated stress loads. So what's your daily accumulated stress load? It's all the distress that you put in minus all the you stress, which is the positive stress. And at the end of the day, there's a number. Well, if your sleep is ineffective, what's going to happen is some of Monday's distress is going to end up in Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of Monday and Tuesday is going to end up in Wednesday. Well, guess what? When you're applying positive stress management tools like um, exercise, breath work, meditation, all these holistic practices, you're reducing your daily accumulated stress load. So the next day when you wake up, Monday's distress never makes it into Tuesday. And as you continue to keep doing that on your 14th day and your 15th day and your 16th day and your 30th day and your four months and your six months, your eight months, a whole year has gone by and you've changed the way that you eat. You're meditating for five or 10 minutes a day. You're exercising for 20 minutes a day. You're removing tension from your body for 10 or 15 minutes a day. A year later, you look younger, you feel better, you're able to take more emotional risk, you're able to take more professional risk, you're able to take more relationship risk, and life seems pretty easy. Okay? Now there's a third lane. And the third lane is called stress resolution. Right? And what that means is every listener right now who's tuning in to what we're talking about has what's called the lifetime accumulated stress load. And their lifetime accumulated stress load is very high from my research, okay? So whether you're seven or you're 77, the lifetime accumulated stress load is up in the 80 percentile, okay? And so the first thing to do is to begin to reduce that. And you reduce that with stress resolution strategies and stress resolution strategies are systems and tools that you employ that actually diminish your lifetime accumulated stress load and the reason why we consider them stress resolution versus stress management is because they're able to reduce your lifetime accumulated stress load versus your daily accumulated stress load because they have bigger levers. They generate more force. Mm -hmm. And so we could easily, over a year of time, reduce someone's lifetime accumulated stress load by 50%. So let's say you're 42 years old or you're 33 years old. Okay, we can reduce your lifetime accumulated stress load. So from 34 to 35, we can cut that in half. When we cut that in half, the aging process slows down by 50%. Right. And instead of the cart, right, moving down the hill as fast as it can, it stops and now starts slowly going back uphill. Right. So your skin looks better. Your um, your breath is better, your sleep is better, your posture is better, your energy is better, your mood is better, you're more intelligent physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So stress resolution pathway is a pathway to self-realization mm -hmm. and getting into those ecstatic states of intelligence and feeling so that you can really manifest the life that you want through ease and grace right stress ignorance you're managing a life through struggle and strife which simply means you're learning through negative benefit well when you're on the path of stress resolution you're learning through positive benefit because most humans because of our history and our ancestry 
if you go back three or four generations or even 10 to 14 generations, what are you going to find? You're going to find war, right? You're going to find pain. You're going to find uh, pestilence. You're, you're going to find disease. And all of these strategies have been passed into our bodies through the epigenetics. And so when we get on the pathway of stress resolution, we start to reverse and transform and transmute all of those energies, all of those insights, all of those limiting beliefs that led to survival-based strategies that were created 14 to 10 generations ago. And so we actually start to unplug from the stress matrix so that we're in the world, yet we're no longer of the world. And just tapping into the survival-based strategies and thinking about the fight or flight response, Christopher, there's one question I want to ask you before we have to go. Okay. We can each perceive the same event in different ways, whether that be a trip to the beach or an incident. How does your our personal perception of reality affect the fight or flight response? Yeah, well, the thing about it, what's interesting is it's it's a loop, right? So when I'm locked into the protective mode, meaning my inner resistance is low, okay, and my outer stress is high, okay? So my inner resistance is low, my outer resistance is high, and I go to park my car. So I can get out and enjoy a day at the beach, right? As I'm looking for parking spots and it becomes more and more difficult to find one, because my inner resistance is so low, the outer resistance, right? The outer stress load starts penetrating into me and I start dropping into my strategy, right? And everyone's different, right? There's four states, there's fight, flight, freeze or fawn okay and whatever my strategy is i'm going to drop into that so let's do the inverse of that my inner resistance is high and my outer stress load that's pushing in towards me is low because guess what i got up a half hour earlier i'm getting to the beach before everyone else there's parking spots everywhere hmm. right my day at the beach is going to be joyful and fun, exciting, energetic, grounded, and peaceful because my inner resistance is high. Okay. So what depletes my inner resistance is really the question. Mm -hmm. Or what builds my inner resistance? What depletes or builds my inner resistance depends on whether or not my brain is in a lateralized state of function or it's in a full state of function. So what's a full state of function look like? A full state of function looks like both the left and the right hemisphere are turned on electrically. When I'm in a lateralized state of function, one hemisphere is turned on electrically and the other one is turned off. So now my body is malformed, meaning the right side of my body is strong, tight, and short, and the left side of my body is long, weak, and flaccid. So if I'm moving through the world in a lateralized state of function, that means my inner resistance is low and my perception of reality is whatever's outside of me is a threat. Mm -hmm. When my inner resistance is high, my perception is everything outside of me is an opportunity to grow. Yeah, very different. Yeah. And so how do we, how, how, how do the listeners build their inner resistance? They get out of a lateralized state of function, which is very difficult to do because it takes a very specific practice. And there's only so many practitioners in the world who actually do this practice. And it's pulling someone's nervous system out of fight or flight. And so I've developed strategies and tools that allow people to pull their bodies out of fight or flight. And when you do that on a semi-consistent basis, what's going to happen is your inner resistance is going to get high and your perception of reality is going to change relative to having a high state of inner resistance. And now you see the world as an opportunity. So for instance, when COVID went on, 
well, what do you think happened for me? I flew everywhere. I traveled all over the world during COVID. Why? Because my inner resistance is very high. So my perception of reality was I wasn't bothered by anything happening at all. I had no doubt ever that I was going to get sick. And of course, I never did. Because my inner resistance is really, really high because I've been practicing stress resolution strategies for 22 years. Yeah, so you've built that up over a long time. And I think it's something that can grow as the days, the weeks, the years go on, but it's something that we can all start right Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Make a difference. And I think utilizing holistic approaches, focusing on the nervous system as well, is just totally life-changing. And I can relate to percent <laughs> that you've spoken about today. So it's been wonderful having this conversation. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us and all of the Thank stresses you. and strains that you've been on um, during your, your life so far. And of course, sharing with us your, your three pathways or your three lanes about stress, the stress ignorance, stress awareness, and stress resolution. So I'm sure the listeners are going to find it all really interesting. And if they wanted to keep in touch with you, where's the best place to do that, Christopher? The best place to get in touch with me. And it's funny because uh, I'm going to digress for a moment. Uh, we got into a different part of the conversation and I brought in something that I never brought in before because of your presence is really there's four lanes, right? So there's there's stress ignorance, there's stress awareness, there's stress management, and there's stress resolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you'd asked me that question two weeks ago, there would have been three lanes. So there's something about your presence that brought up this other level of awareness around it. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, because all the other podcasts that I'm going to be on in the future, their listeners will benefit from that. So thank you so much. The way that people can stay in touch with me is very simple. You go to truebodyintelligence.com. You can peruse around the site. I'm building a new site. Um, there's a little bit of education on there. Uh, but actually, I keep the information pretty thin. Uh, the most important thing to do is... Order the book, right? The book is called Free for Life, right? If you want to get deeper into the story, and I do it uh, in an audio version, so you can take it to the gym, you can listen to it on your way to work, you can listen to it while you're on the train um, or the subway, um, then that's a simple way to get into things. You email me at support at truebodyintelligence.com and somebody will get back to you mm -hmm. and we will figure out a way in which we can help you and of course what's available for everyone who listens is you know like a stress management you know free pack that i give where i give you one best size to do i give you a chapter of a book to listen to i give you one of the eight stepping stones to listen to so you can already get started on the journey and it's of no cost to you Right. It's of no cost to me either because I already set things up. Mm -hmm. So I would use those tools, you know, do things for 28 days so that you're already start building that consistency in. And the one that I gave you, the one best size I gave you is for the large intestine, which is to reduce obsessive compulsive thought and to allow you to complete things, to be more highly principled and to be more spiritually aware and more energetically sensitive so take advantage of those free tools sounds like a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of and i'll make sure that the links for those are in the show notes so that the listeners can go straight there wonderful well, thank you ever so much for your time today christopher i've really enjoyed our conversation <laughs> thank you i've had a very nice time appreciate you having me on Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Beautifully Balanced podcast. Please press subscribe to be notified when the next episode is out every other Wednesday.